Turn in your Bibles, please. Matthew chapter 5, as we continue our study. You can remain seated while we read through our text. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Follow along with me. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Patrick Ferguson was an expert marksman in the British Army. In fact, he was so good, he had invented his own rifle, his own musket, and created his own sniper unit. Am I off? No? Can you hear me? Okay. I just want to know whether I needed to speak up louder. He was recognized as being the best shot in the whole British Army. He was a sniper, but he abided by certain rules. The first one being that he would never shoot a soldier who wasn't aware of his presence. That's pretty tough to do as a sniper. During the Revolutionary War, in the Battle of Brandyville, he saw two soldiers, two officers, coming on horseback toward him. But because he wanted to abide by the rules, his personal rules of integrity... He didn't want to just ambush them. Pretty tough for a sniper. So as they got close to him, he stood up and made his position known. One of the officers quickly rode off, giving him a clear shot at his back. But he wouldn't shoot another soldier in the back. Later, in that same battle, he was at a field hospital for an injured elbow and learned that the officer who rode away and gave him a clear shot at his back was General George Washington. I mentioned last week in our text that Jesus here is teaching in progression. Teaching first about how a true believer experiences spiritual happiness when they, when they realize that they're spiritually broke and there's no way out of it except to accept the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And when they sincerely do this, they will have an odd, not not only a sorrow when they first realize how much of a sinner they are, but they will have an ongoing sorrow over their sin, knowing that they need to be changed from the inside out. And that, in turn, gives them a gentle and kind heart attitude yielding all control and strength to God and not relying on themselves for anything, but allowing the Lord to change them. And if, in fact, someone is a true believer, and I can't stress this point enough, a true believer, that should give us a spiritual hunger 
and thirst for righteousness, a craving so strong that it actually is spiritually painful to know when we fail and how much more we need to be like him. But today, today we turn a corner in this study. You see, the first four things that we we study, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those uh, who are meek, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These first four things that we have studied, have, they all have to do with an inner an inner attitude of a true believer's heart. And now, now, now we start to look at what happens when someone's heart is really changed and how they show it. In a way, it's saying this is what happens when someone has a right relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's see what Jesus is saying here. We just read the verse, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, the first thing is, what did Jesus mean when he used the word merciful? Well, on on your notes there, it's not merely feeling sorry for someone. Surely all of us at one time or another have felt sorry for someone who is in need. You could be watching TV or looking at a magazine and seeing the suffering faces of the people around the world, those who are hungry, naked, diseased, destitute, dying. And let me, uh, let me be clear, it's easy for all of us to feel sorry for these people And many, many, many people contribute to ministries that focus on meeting the needs of these people. But the mercy Jesus is teaching here is much more than that. In fact, it's sympathy in action. You see, for a true believer, this is where the rubber meets the road. Because the heart of a true believer puts sympathy into action. These are opportunities that come right in your own backyard. It's a mercy that focuses on other people and not ourselves. And it's more than just saying, this drives me crazy when people do this. Oh, I'm praying for you. even though they know there are needs to be met. I can remember when Cheryl and I, when, well, when Cheryl was pregnant with our second daughter, Jessica. We were really, really afraid of having another child after Melissa was born. In fact, we waited five years to have her. And there was a new kind of test that came out right in the 1980s there somewhere. Jessica was born in 88, somewhere right around there, maybe the early 80s. And this test was something that they could uh, find out. It was more clear whether there would be something wrong with the baby. And you know what it is. It's called an amniocentesis. It's famous now. So, we thought, well, what should we do? Should we go ahead and have it done? Because we really wanted to know. We really wanted to know if Jessica would have any kind of handicap. While preparing for the test, and we decided to have the test done, the person comes in and they explain everything that's going to take place, how long it's going to take, what the risks are, and uh, do you know what it is, or do I have to tell you what it is? You know what it is. They stick stick a needle through the belly and go into the uh, amniotic sac and draw fluid out. 
But they also tell you what the risks are. Could happen that something will happen. And the person says that if it shows a handicap, you have, you have the choice right then and there to abort the baby. Because, they explained, we surely want to show mercy to the child. That's what our country calls mercy. That's not what Jesus is speaking about here. We found it more merciful that God would allow us to have another handicapped child. Aborting Jessica wasn't even, and we were not believers then. That wasn't even an option for us. We just wanted to know whether she was going to be handicapped so we could prepare ourselves for taking care of two handicapped children. But the Lord calls us to be merciful to those who are in need. And I'm glad he changed my heart. Because the religious people, as the Bible teaches us, those who are in need, the religious people back in these days, you know, the muckety-mucks, the Pharisees, they don't want to do with that. They don't want to deal with these people. And God has changed my heart through all the years and, and, and all the garbage that I grew up in and, and being taught how to just look down on people who were less fortunate than me and who were a different color than me. It's sympathy in action. It's also failing to receive the punishment I deserve. Do I hear any amen for that? This is the heart of a true believer, learning, knowing, and practicing the mercy they received from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's a struggle for, and here, that's a struggle. This whole thing of mercy is a struggle for many believers because you know what they do? And, and here, and, and, and maybe you'll disagree, but maybe uh, I'll kind of get you to think about this point. You see, many believers will pour millions and millions of dollars into overseas ministries for the poor, right? You're with me. Having, and at the same time, having great apprehension in giving any kind of amount of money to the same kind or some kind of ministry in the United States. True? Whether you disagree with me or not, I'm right. Just look at, just look at the money. Just look at the money statistics. And I know the thinking because I because this kind of bugs me too. Hey, this is the land of opportunity. Get a job and do something. But let me tell you something. You have you have countries and you have people overseas and I see them in all the countries that I visit and Dr. Vanderwer would tell you the same thing. A lot of them have the mentality, well, the United States will help us out. They do. They wait for you. I'm not saying don't do it. They wait for you to do it. You think there's people overseas that purposely don't get a job and purposely don't do things because they know the U.S. is going to fund them? Same thing that happens here. It's no different. They don't make the effort the same way many people in our own country don't make the effort. It happens both ways. But this is sympathy in action 
and 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 it's recognizing it, uh, that you know what when you become a believer in Jesus Christ we don't get the punishment we deserve uh, you know what all of us all of us deserve to be in hell eternally man but one thing here how does the concept of mercy relate to other biblical terms well the first thing here mercy is found in love This is a sacrifice to meet the needs of others, sometimes at a great cost. This kind of love shows up in the hearts of God's people who say, I'm glad he gave us his thoughts. We'll love her. See, this is what Cheryl and I were thinking. Because God gave us his thoughts. We'll love her if she's handicapped just as much as our other handicapped child. No matter what the cost, and I've already shared with you how much it costs us and still costs us. You want to give us two handicapped children? Okay. And mercy, mercy goes beyond forgiveness. And the the concept here is going the extra mile, not only to seek and give forgiveness from someone, but going beyond that to meet a need that they may have. And this is not always an easy thing to do, believe me. It's not. Having sympathy for someone who has sinned against you, and then... Extending a hand of mercy to them. Because many times the reaction that we have is, you know what, we're just going to make them suffer a little more. We're just going to, to just, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on for this forgiveness thing because I just want to see them sweat. Oh, I just want them to feel bad a little more. Want them to uh, chew on this for quite a while. Mercy goes beyond forgiveness. And mercy is a balance to justice. If, If we can put this point into its proper focus, it's easier to understand. Justice, if someone was to commit murder... Justice would be they would receive the death penalty, right? That's justice. Mercy is getting a life sentence. You see the difference? Justice doesn't excuse sin. Mercy is available to all those who repent. And, and, and this is a key here. The key is repentance. Now, here, look upon this. There's a, there's a stone-cold sinner, stone-cold murderer standing in front of a judge who has committed first-degree murder. And we see about it, we hear about these things all the time. And he's standing, and he's standing before the judge, and the judge is just getting to render a sentence. And the judge looks at the, looks at the murderer and says, do you have anything to say? Now, nah. glad I did it. How much mercy do you think the judge is going to have on that guy? The judge would probably say, put him in the chamber now and throw the switch. But if, but if somebody was sincere and broken and, uh, and, and, and they said, and you've seen these kind of pleas, usually the judge has pretty good wisdom on, on how much he leeway, and they just cry out and acknowledge that they did wrong and ask for leniency, and usually they get it. The whole key here, the, the key not not only for this murderer, but for all of us, is repentance. Because that's what it took 
for you to become a child of God. You had to turn. You had to turn from one direction and go in the other. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. And that's the key. We don't excuse the sin. But repentance must take place. Well, here's the next thing. When do acts of mercy glorify God? Well, the first thing here is when they are done as unto Christ. This is the heart of a true believer whose heart has been transformed, hungering and thirsting for righteousness to be like Christ. Let me just stay right there. Let me me read you something here. From 2540, and the king will answer him, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. That's the heart of a true believer. And when they involve the giving, uh, when it, when they involve the giving of ourselves, and 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 here, this is uh, this is critical, because a true believer that has mercy in his heart, they will give others top priority in their lives, their needs before their own, showing mercy to the people who need it most. And when it's done without expectation. Look at the verse again from our text. Verse 7. Just one thing here. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This verse here does not teach that if you show mercy to someone, they will return it to you. Which is the motive for some believers. But God is the one who extends his mercy to us when we are merciful to other people, making them a priority instead of ourselves. Why? Because God knows the heart. God knows the heart and the motive of each and every one of us. What are some of the consequences of failing to be merciful? Risking lack of forgiveness from God. I gave you that reference there, Matthew eighteen twenty one to 25. And an inability to love God. But it's the third thing that I really, really want you to focus on. A possible defilement of your children to the third and fourth generation. This is something that not many people will talk about. But the commandment stands as God put it down. I see all too often when a parent or parents are not merciful. And here, here's what they teach their children. Look out for number one. Step over as many people as you can to get to the top. Don't worry about others. They're not concerned with you, so you shouldn't be concerned with them. And then their children grow up that way. And then their children's children grow up that way. And then their children's children's children grow up that way. It affects children. It affects grandchildren. It affects great-grandchildren. And if they see you as some grumpy old Christian that won't even get that that won't even give anything to help any, anyone else because they're poor or a different color, how do you think they're going to grow up? The same way. See, they, nobody likes to talk about this part. You are a product, as I am, of your environment. 
that you grew up in. If you're a racist, like I was, you were brought up in a home that was racist, which I was. If you don't give to the poor, you grew up in a home where it was look out for number one. It carries on. It does. So, what does having a right relationship with Jesus Christ look like? Having a poverty of spirit? Having a genuine sorrow over sin? Having gentleness and strength under control? Being desperate for righteousness? And being merciful to others? But I've got one more. Just put your papers down. Close your Bibles. I've got one more thing to tell you. Just listen, please. There was a soldier in the Confederate Army by the name of Sergeant Richard Kirkland. And on December 13th, 1862, in the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Confederate Army held, held a high ground. And the Confederate soldiers had a six-foot wall in front of them. And so what they did is they shot over the wall at the Union soldiers coming up after them. So if you kind of get the picture, the wall's up here and the Confederate soldiers are shooting down at these Union soldiers coming up the hill. They killed 11,000 of them. They either killed or wounded them. 11,000 in the battle at Fredericksburg. Just boom, 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 boom. Throughout the night, Sergeant Kirkland could hear the agonizing cries of the wounded Union soldiers. By daybreak, he couldn't stand it anymore and appealed to a superior officer for permission to climb over the wall. He went over the wall. And initially, the Union soldiers shot at him, thinking that he had gone over the wall to go and rob all the dead soldiers of all their valuables. But they ceased firing when they realized that what he had with them were canteens filled with water and blankets for the wounded Union soldiers. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again with much thanksgiving for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I thank you for changing my heart. Lord, I ask that you would keep changing it. Lord, that I would just look at others in, in, in a different way each day of how I can help other people, Lord. Those who are less fortunate than me, those who are a different color than me, Lord, have mercy upon us when we purposely don't lift a finger to help somebody when they know they need help. Help us to remember how much mercy you give us every day and in eternity. Lord, we love you. This is a lesson each and every one of us needs to learn each day. Dying to ourselves and putting others first, no matter what their need. 
And I ask you, Lord, that you would help us to learn this lesson over and over and over again. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Over and over and over again. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Over and over and over again. 